All right. Good morning, um, Pete. Thank you so much for joining the GovCon Giants podcast and our series with accountants and attorneys. We are such, we are privileged to have you on our call today. So um, our audience, we have a treat for you today. We have Mr. Pete Ragone uh, with us, and he is from SC&H Group. So I'm going to just tell you a little bit about um, Pete and his background, and then we're just going to enjoy our conversation together today. And hopefully you guys are going to learn some great things about accounting from the GovCon space. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and get started. So Pete is the audit director of SCNH Group. He joined the firm in 2015. He started in public accounting in 1990, and now he leads financial statement audits, reviews, and compilations for domestic and international organizations. Pete's clients have included certified small businesses, including SBA 8A program participants and middle and large market clients from various industries, such as government contracting, manufacturing, construction, technology, healthcare, and nonprofit. In addition, he maintains expertise in cost accounting, DCAA audit compliance, incurred cost submissions, the FAR, cost counting standards, foreign currency translations accounting, fair value accounting, complex revenue uh, recognition issues, accounting for income tax provisions, accounting for shared share-based compensation and accounting for business combinations. Woo, a Thanks lot a that you are focused on, expert in. So we have the right person in the seat with us today. And so I'll talk just a little bit about SCNH group. They yeah, and it. you can shorten that to SCNH. It's okay. SCNH. SCNH, <laughs> all right. So founded in 1991. Right. And so that group is out of Baltimore, the Maryland, D.C. area, uh, and then they focus on innovative and entrepreneurial approach to management, consulting and accounting that puts their goals at the forefront. With every engagement, they deliver powerful minds, passionate teams and proven results. And they have 11 practices that they work within, and a few of them are auditing, tax, investment, banking, and advisory, wealth management, corporate restructuring, and an interesting one, affordable housing real estate. I, I definitely, that piqued my interest. Um, so we're going to turn it over to Pete. Feel free to share a little bit more about your organization and what you guys do. would love to hear. Thank you, Randy, and I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be interviewed and have this discussion and uh, to hopefully give some insight and informative uh, topics to, to people watching. Uh, yeah, SCNH, uh, was, as you mentioned, founded in 1991 by three former uh, Arthur Anderson uh, state and local tax guys uh, in, in, out of Baltimore. And from those very humble beginnings, uh, we are now almost 400 people and three offices besides the Baltimore, we have uh, Columbia, uh, Ellicott City, and then Tyson's where I'm the lot of practice leader here, uh, right around the Tyson's area. And it's, uh, you know, it's amazing what we've done, uh, but the real three tenants of, of our tent poles are, you know, clients, colleagues, and community. So it really is a, a passion for excellence, serving our clients and, and you know, taking care of our colleagues. Uh, we. I will say we're one of the few places, if maybe one of the only ones, mm. uh, where we really look at are our staff working too much, oh. not how many hours can they put into the week because we've got deadlines. We really focus on managing work-life balance, which awesome. is, I think, a lot of places uh, play, pay lip service. Yep. We actually do it. And then another, uh, giving back to the community. So we are very active throughout the year, not just you know once once a year, but throughout the year, uh, doing things like upcoming the Polar Plunge uh, in Baltimore. That's a big fundraiser. Uh, we just did something in D.C. of uh, uh, the Reese in Arlington Center. And um, every year uh, we shut down the firm and do a whole day of service in June uh, where the entire firm participates, including with our interns. So we really take pride in that. Uh, so and then, you know, from. As you mentioned, our service lines, uh, I'm part of the audit practice. I work closely with our tax practice. 
uh, because our clients are private, mainly privately held companies in that space. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't audit public companies, but we do have practices that do work for large public companies, including very large multi-billion dollar government contractors. Mm. Uh, we do have a consulting practice that helps the large contractors that are doing acquisitions with integration, uh, layering on software, dashboard reporting, data analytics that are helping them um, really look at forecasting and future uh, outcomes as opposed to just a historical controller type reporting, financial reporting on historical, but forward looking, uh, looking type uh, analytics, which is uh, yeah, really helpful in this very competitive market and area. Uh, yeah, my bio does say I've, I've done a lot, uh, but for the last, say, 15 years, I've really focused predominantly on government contracting. Awesome. Uh, all the way back to when sequestration, if people remember that, uh, even before then, uh, I do have a smattering of non-public uh, or non-GovCon, but I really do did want to focus on government contracting, helping small, especially the smaller businesses that don't have the resources like the largest have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that that, uh, you know, veteran owned, service disabled owned, that, you know, woman owned, uh, all those uh, types of businesses where maybe they started out as a government, con you know, working for the government, they're in that space. And they're like, I'm seeing these other contracts being done, you know, by subcontractors. Why can't I do that? Or prime contractors. So helping them navigate the landscape, which is very complex. There's a lot of regulations. Uh, yes. So it's not just understanding gap and accounting and getting your taxes done. There's the compliance aspect, which is the most um, difficult, and I say different aspect of government contracting than any other business for the most part, for industry. Okay, and so when did you make the pivot to government contracting? In it was, uh, I'll say, after I left uh, KPMG okay. and decided to, to join, a, at that time, a large national firm, and they needed someone that was heavily focused on government contracting. And so I just made the, and so in 2011, um, and then after a few years, uh, I was reached out to by FC and eight. So I've been here now going on nine years because of my expertise in the yes. government contracting space uh, to help drive and, and build that practice here, which I've been doing. Awesome. And not, not alone, obviously I got a great right. team. Uh, we just promoted a, colleague of mine who started shortly after I did to partner effective uh, October 1, Justin Acker. And we're very excited uh, that he's he's a partner now here too. So, you know, we're, we're growing and, you know, we're, it, it's a point that, uh, you know, we're just trying to maintain um, our existing clients and not grow too much where people mm -hmm. get burned out. Uh, and we're able to choose our clients now, which is a nice, you know, it used to not be that way. Uh, a part of that has to do with the fact that there just aren't as many accounting students coming out in the industry, especially in the last five years. Uh, I heard a stat that the University of Maryland uh, accounting department five years ago had a thousand students and they're down to maybe 400. That's a huge drop. Yes, it's a huge drop. It is a big issue facing our industry, but there's also opportunities. Uh, so that's the thing. Uh, you still need to do your taxes and get an audit even if you're having losses <laughs> and <laughs> so that's the one thing about the that, yes. that 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 you know what we do it's it's a it's it's a necessity right the banks rely on it the government relies on it um you know small business a days uh require a days uh or require a review if they hit two million in revenue if they hit 10 million they they're required to get a financial statement audit uh, so there is that cost there is that that requirement. And you know, so it's helping, I would say, protect the taxpayer that they're they're complying with GAP as well as you know, the FAR and, and and the DCA requirement. So that's why that's why I pivoted really to just focus because um, I, I found that success, you know, you can know a lot of things a little bit, or you can know a few things in depth. And I think government contract is one of those areas where Learning it in depth has really helped uh, my growth and as well as the growth mm -hmm. of the firm in this area. Well, that's that's awesome. And and one of the things, I mean, that we know uh, as small businesses or even medium sized businesses, because we, I was actually just having this conversation with um, the FAA 
uh, some of the people we, I know in there. And one of the things that we're seeing, right? So you have the small businesses that um, they do really well. And then all of a sudden they, they, they find themselves in no man's land because they've now transitioned and they're a large business. Like, okay, so how, how do we compete here? How We're medium size. We're really still small because we can't, we're nowhere near the large, right? So just think about all the accounting, all the compliance, everything that they are even having to consider. So we're going to continue having those types of conversations. Like how do we have help those uh, businesses, right? That find themselves in that space. Yeah, that dreaded too big to be small, but too small, small to, to be, be truly big. big. Yes. Uh, yes, it is. And, and that's happened, I would say, since 2011. It goes back to sequestration and, and the way they pushed uh, the government contracting rules. Uh, I know at one point there was a, a, an attempt to try to create a mid-size SBA designation, uh, but that went by the wayside. Uh, but I think that might be something that should be considered at some point. It's like they're small, but then there's mid-size yes. and, and they struggle and they struggle to continue to grow. Uh, and to, you know, once once those set-asides run out, that that is the biggest issue facing the 8A landscape. And it has not changed. It is still mm -hmm. not a very good stat as is eight to nine out of 10 eight A's when they graduate fail. And, and that's a problem. It, it is, it, it's, it's the ones that do those purple unicorns. Uh, there are things that they've done uh, early on mm -hmm. that I see uh, that helps them. One is not just live off eight A contracts, go out there yes. and try to win open bid, uh, and as well as get into very good teaming relationships to make you mm -hmm. valuable to a prime as well as to an agency. Those are those are very important. Having resources, surrounding themselves with folks that have done it, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's as a board advisor or or maybe an outsourced uh, CEO, CFO, so that the founder doesn't have to be the CEO because they're probably were doing government contracting work and they mm -hmm. know how to do the work that they were doing for their for their client. Right. But they don't know how to run a company. And, and that's where, you know, if you're small, I say outsource as much as you can outsource, you know, your, your accounting, your back office. Don't try to be the bookkeeper. Don't try to learn that. I find those many think they can. I'm like, no, focus on what you do best. And if you're an engineer and serving clients or, or, you know, or, or, uh, working in the Intel space, focus on that. Hire the people, uh, like SCNH or others uh, who can do it and you know, kind of pay by the drink until you grow, right? So, right. and get to the point where it makes sense to bring it all in house. Uh, other ways are through what's called a PEO, where right. they, you know, an insperity mm -hmm. or an ADP, where they basically use them. Can you define the PEO? I know it's a professional employer organization, right? Yeah, it's a professional right. employer right. organization. Thing. Yeah, I get. I live in that acronym world. Right, we live in the that. acronym right. world. Professional employer organization, where effectively the employees are really employees of the PEO, and they're effectively leased to the government contracting company. But where that helps is in like fringe costs, where they can be part of a bigger 401k plan, uh, maybe better health benefits at a small company. It's tough. Health costs have, have have skyrocketed in the last 10, 12 years. And being competitive in that landscape, it's important. Uh, but there, there there does become a point where when you do look at the math and look at your costs, if you've hired enough people and you have enough contracts, moving off that PEO so that you can, because you are you're, you don't need that benefit from the PEO. So there is... But it's tough, and, and it's always uh, what are the what are the what are the numbers say and forecasting and, and accurate forecasting, no matter how small you are, is important. Yes, and that is definitely something I want us to come back to because I saw that case study that you guys did um, with that one with the one company that wanted to take all their data and and forecast. So I definitely want to talk about that because I see how that can benefit definitely the contractor as they're planning making, you know, like how much we're going to spend, like how much we need to charge and et cetera. So I'll definitely come back to that, but I want us to kind of start from the beginning and kind of work our way through the more complex uh, thoughts. So you're setting up, you're now getting started. How do you even know the right structure, right? right. 
to. Yeah, that's right. That's the first up. question. I want to start a company. I want to start my own business. Where's the starting point? Uh, right. And there's various types. You could just be a self-employed person mm -hmm. uh, and you do it under your social security number and your report and you do a, a what's called a schedule C on your 1040. Uh, I would not recommend doing that. I would recommend creating a company. And there are many resources out there online, like bizfilings.com, where you can incorporate and create a, you know, an entity. You have, and then you have to look at what state you're going to do it in. Uh, Delaware is a popular state because it's low cost. You don't necessarily have to be in the state. Mm -hmm. uh, many people just default to where they are. If they live in Virginia, if they live in Maryland, they'll default to those state. But, you know, Delaware is one of those very friendly incorporation type states. So uh, you'll see like large multinational companies who are started incorporated in Delaware. And there's a reason for that. The laws the, and their fees are a little bit lower and, uh, so those are things to look at. And then it's what type of entity? Is it a limited liability company, which was mm -hmm. created years ago, uh, which sounds like it is. It's to limit the liability of the individual that owns the company so they can't be held personally re responsible for their assets mm -hmm. uh, if something happens. Uh, from that LLC, it could be the individual. If you're one person, maybe you're going to into business with another person. There's two of you. Then you can still do the LLC. Then it's a, do I elect a partnership return? Or there's what's called an S corporation election. And that that becomes a, like a C corp, which is a company that pays taxes out of the corporation. But an S corp, from a federal tax perspective, is, is, is a pass-through entity. And the profits and losses are taxed at the shareholder level, at the partner level. So even though they're an LLC, that S corp treats it like it's a corporation. The difference between partnership and say a corporation is, and this is where government contracting is very important. As a partnership, the owners cannot get a W-2 paycheck. They're, they're precluded from getting a W-2 paycheck oh. in a partnership. They get distributions, they get a K-1. In government contracting, you need to understand labor costs and so salaries and wages, you can pay yourself as a CEO or you know an owner for the work you're doing using that paycheck W-2 model where payroll taxes are withheld and, and done through, say, a payroll service. Mm -hmm. So that's very important to help understand your cost rates when that when you're only taking income through what's called distributions through equity and not running through the income statement, it makes it difficult to understand what's, what's my profitability here. Uh, and you're also on the hook for all the self-employment taxes okay, yeah. outside of the entity, but personally. So, so I, I highly recommend, there might be other reasons to do a partnership, but you know, the S corp is a very popular mm -hmm. and common uh, um, option. And then C corporation is just the entity pays corporate taxes. The downfall of the C corporation is dividends. If you do dividends, they're taxed again. So there's that double taxation aspect. Where we typically see C corporations is uh, they may have been a commercial company diving into the government contracting space, or they're owned by a private equity firm that cannot own an S corporation. So they convert them to a C corp. So there's these rules that require that. Uh, but okay. it, so that right there and how do you get started in what state and then it's are you filing your returns your tax returns not just income tax could there be state and local returns such as sales tax returns personal property tax returns or like in virginia there's what's called the bpol uh, business and professional occupational license tax that's based on gross receipts of, of revenue generated in the locality whether it's fairfax Loudon, Leesburg, Alexandria, Arlington, that locality has a tax. Uh, so there's a myriad of taxes. People just think, oh, the federal government, you have you know, income tax or state income tax. That's just one small piece. Oh, wow. So it's navigating those things. And I think that's what blindsides a lot of new business owners is like, wait, what is this? And why do I have an annual uh, filing fee with, with the state I'm in? And why do I have this state filing? And so it's understanding that. So I'd say having a very good tax advisor, not mm -hmm. just income tax, but state, local, 
helping you navigate what the rules are in the local. Um, mm -hmm. And if you move to another state, you know, all the states, they, they have different rules. Met someone at a veteran owned business, uh, small business coalition uh, event, a networking event, and she had gotten advice from her CPA in Ohio for Virginia, and that advice was absolutely wrong. It was it was just bad advice, and she created an entity and filed a sales tax return, which were not necessary because she wasn't selling anything. There was no goods. <laughs> so those are things that you have to you have to make sure you have an advisor that knows not just the federal but the state and local rules. So, so, so what would be some of the maybe questions or how, how do you filter through so many different um, accounting firms, right? To find the one that really fits for you and really understand what you're attempting to do then. Yeah, it's tough. Uh, I would say if they're in, if, if they're going to be a government contractor and they know other government contractors, talk to them, Hey, who are you using? And, and that's a good starting point. Like, like I mentioned, be involved in networking groups, whether it's AFCIA or CCAF, uh, Small Emerging Contractors Association, right? Uh, the various networking groups, be a part of those and, and you'll find resources, you'll find CPAs that attend like myself and folks I work with, uh, be involved in, in, in those like the veteran owned uh, type organizations. Uh, the VETS has a conference coming up, VETS 24. And, in uh, mm -hmm. May, uh, that that's always a good uh, conference that I recommend if you're a veteran-owned business or or serving those as a service provider. Those are the things that really uh, I think help an owner make those decisions. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they just default to someone they know or a local CPA they might know, but they really need to do their their due diligence yes. and vetting. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, so some of the resources you would say, you said there's CCAF and there is, what are some of the other ones? So CCAF is, what would, how do you, what's the That's the Small Emerging uh, Contractors Association, uh, S-E-C-A-F. Okay. Yeah. That's resource or, that can look yeah, into. Yeah, it's, uh, the full acronym is, because uh, <laughs> it's, it's always, it's the Small and Emerging Contractors Advisory Forum. Forum. Okay. CCAF.org if someone wants to go there. Yep. Uh, be a resource. Yeah. There's uh, other ones are uh, AFCIA, which is the um, uh, sure we can. Uh, that's that's a whole nother acronym. acronym yeah. AFCIA. <laughs> AFCEA. -E yeah. That is AFCEA.org. Mm -hmm. uh, again. So there's there's various ones. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. I said, there's the veteran owned um, small business coalition uh, yeah. that has meetings in Arlington uh, monthly and they do trainings and they, uh, and they have their national conference. So there, there's yes. many out there and I'm happy if someone wants to reach me offline to provide other other resources. And I'm always happy to be at a resource. You know, someone well, we, wants to reach and out. we appreciate that. So thank yeah. you so much, because I know. That is one of the fears and the concerns um, small businesses have, whether they're now starting or even if they're, you know, two years in, you know, they, the cost, like everything's going to cost me. I don't have that type of money right now. How do I even set up, you know, like, what do I even do? How do I even reach out and put someone on retainer when I can't right. even afford it? Right. And that's where people get into trouble because, well, I can't afford the, the council. So I'm kind of figuring it out. I Google, right? Google is my Google, right? Yeah. Google, Google is my friend. <laughs> Some of those, yeah. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. Search it, <laughs> right? No, um, absolutely. And and it's tough. And you know, I know the SBA uh, has its resources, but navigating those can be complex. And then you know, I say if you're going to be a certified small business. I always recommend a small business attorney that specializes in helping uh, folks navigate the rules to help expedite getting approval. So that if you try to do it yourself, I've seen it drag on. It it is it can be complex, and it might you know it might cost some money. But I know ones that are very reasonable, and you know their hope is that you grow and right, and right, the more. 
<laughs> create relationship, so, uh, create a relationship. Always, yes. Yeah. yeah. So things like an SBA attorney that specializes in, in that area, uh, mm -hmm. affiliation rules can be complex. So, you know, sometimes you'll have, oh, my, my parent owns a contract. I want to do it or, you know, a sibling. And there are just affiliation rules that you have to be you know, worried yes. about and, and comply with, which is beyond just accounting and costs. It's relationships and understanding how that can impact negatively impact your ability to own uh, an 8A or small business. So can you talk a little bit since you brought affiliation up? Because that is a, that's a tricky one. It's very tricky. And I'm going to tell you what I tell everyone. I've got really good SBA attorney referral sources that I connect them with because it yeah. is so, it, it, it is a, uh, a lot, of, lot of nuances. Yeah, it's a minefield and yes. it's really a navigating uh, how to avoid those mines <laughs> and how to how to not blow blow your 8A status, whether it's just starting out or maybe yeah. you're looking at doing an acquisition or being acquired. The rules get complex uh, in yes. the 8A world or small business certified world. Yeah. OK, well, I'll save that topic for the attorneys I'll be interviewing. Yeah. <laughs> Affiliation is a big one. And I, I'm happy to give you a couple who, who oh, awesome. I awesome. their names too, but yeah, afterwards, I'm happy to give you a couple. Yeah, awesome. So, okay, well, now, so we're building. Okay, you figured out what structure, hopefully you've gotten some great advice. Now you're going into gov government, the government world, right? So we know about the DCAA, but we, we need to talk about your accounting system. It shouldn't just maybe be on Excel. Maybe it can be on Excel. I don't know. You tell us. What, what's, the, what's the happy median? What's the thoughts there of what they should be considering? As they're you, you absolutely could be on Excel. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, right. There's always QuickBooks. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I know a lot of companies... Uh, Larger software platforms would say, well, they can do what QuickBooks does. Yeah, they can, but they're very expensive. And for a startup company uh, buying, and I'm talking about buying the, the desktop version of QuickBooks, the online versions, like anything, it's, it's a monthly fee and you get what you pay for, uh, but you're beholden to what the online cloud um, software can do, where there are desktop versions that I like. Some are geared towards I wouldn't say government contracting, but project management and project uh, cost reporting, revenue and cost, uh, at least on revenue and direct costs, which is very important aspect of government contracting. So, you know, there's QuickBooks, very inexpensive, all things considered. There are more complex ones, obviously. There's Dell Tech, there's Uninet, there's uh, Start, there's Procast, there's AtWork slash One Link. Uh, there's a there's a plethora of them out there. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, Dell Tech is one that everybody uh, has probably heard of because they tout that they're a DCA approved accounting system, mm -hmm. which is a misnomer, by the way. There is no one software platform that's DCAA approved. Oh. DCA approved accounting system uh, could be QuickBooks with Excel. Uh, it's really has it been vetted by either the DCA. Okay. And, and, and or a third party CPA firm, which has uh, been allowed to be done recently because the DCA got so back on. So can you talk about can you talk about DCAA? What does the stand for? What is that? Yeah, Defense Contractors Audit right? Association. Which, by the way, so DCA was initially just for defense, right? And uh -huh. then expanded to they had to audit uh, civilian agencies as well, and then as resources got constrained, they stopped doing the, the civilian agency work uh, audits and incurred cost emission audits and those type of things. They still will do provisional rates and things like that, uh, serving as a cognitive agency. But the DCAA uh, comes in if you're on cost plus contracts and you need what's called provisional rates, they'll do the approvals. Uh, things like forward rate pricing, uh, which is another aspect of, hey, I'm, these are my rates. These are my forward-looking rates, and they formally approve them. Uh, there's uh, the incurred cost submission uh, that gets audited by DCA. If, if you know, if, again, you're now on DOD contracts and not civilian, the civilian agencies can hire out and do hire out third-party CPA firms to do that work. I used to do that work, so I have audited incurred cost submissions. So I've helped clients prepare incurred cost submissions. And I've also been on the other side auditing incurred cost submissions, which is a valuable 
um, knowledge to have in this space. Right. So I think that's also something that sets myself and our firm apart. Okay. So what are some of the things that they look for, right? What are some of the things that a contractor really should be considering as they want to remain compliant or even as they're really setting up their books? Yeah. So having a good chart of account that properly segregates costs between you know, and revenues by project, by contract, or what they call CLIN, contract line item number or task order, and tracking those revenues and costs at the project contract level, and then tracking what's indirect costs, overhead, fringe, GNA, and you can have multiple types of what's called pools or cost pools. Those are your simple ones, overhead, fringe, GNA. And I have a whole presentation, by the way, I've done on cost okay. pools and understanding wrap rates and indirect okay. rates, as well as passing the DCAA accounting system exam. And But in a nutshell, it's understanding those costs and what costs get in the bucket. And then even more importantly are the concept of the FAR Part 31 unallowable costs. And this doesn't mean non-deductible. A lot of people go, is that impact taxes? This has nothing to do with taxes. This is under, can you bill the government for these costs? And it's segregating those costs. So that's what that incurred cost submission audit, that's what the DCA is looking for, is the company including in their billings and in their in, in what they're billing the government and their costs, things that they shouldn't be, like alcohol. They go out, they All have right. a meal, okay. you know, advertising, marketing, that's unallowed, paying attorneys to help with the merger and organization restructuring, that's unallowed. Other attorney costs are allowable. You know, things of that nature is understanding all the, and there's a myriad of them, there's, and, and are the unreasonable compensation, you know, those type of things. And, and I, I, one thing I've heard, if it's fun, it's unallowable. <laughs> oh, so that's like, a good uh, one to put yeah, it. That's a good like one to put it. Typically, you know, flying first class is not allowable. You know, things of that nature. It it could be if the contract requires it, and it's if there are. So there's think, there's a okay. it depends in a lot of those allowed costs, and it's knowing where that line spills over to. It's unallowable, or mm -hmm. no, it is allowable, and here's why. Uh, and it's very complex. So that's important, and. From a small contractor, most likely they're not having to worry about that right away. They're not doing cost plus contracts. They're on fixed price right. or time of material. Uh, so it's really important uh, once you move into that cost plus space. But I say set it up right from the beginning because it's easier to do it right from the beginning when you have zero costs and have yes. a structure set up than when you all of a sudden you've won 10, 20 contracts and now you have, yeah. Oh, now what do I do? Right. Uh, so that to me, it's it's get the format set right from the beginning and then you can scale it. Makes total sense. So you mentioned fringe and overhead and GNA. Um, is there a, a quick cheat of how what's to, to tell the difference? Like, how yeah. do you know what's the difference between right. those? And let's just start with direct costs, right? Direct costs are those costs that are specifically for that contract. The direct labor, they're actually performing something specific to the contract or, or other direct costs like materials, supplies, travel costs needed, uh, things of that nature. For the, 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 the indirect costs, the typical is overhead. So that's costs that you need to support multiple contracts. So like a project manager, there's not really direct billable, but they're overseeing the operations mm -hmm. of, of multiple contracts. So there's that there is a gray area and it's tough to define what's overhead in GNA, but if it's if it's supporting multiple contracts but not directly billable, typically that's overhead. And that okay. could be all types of costs, labor costs, mm -hmm. IT. Uh, thing and rent because you have a, a office space right, and you're right. housing people working on contracts those type of things what we call facility costs uh, fringe are costs that benefit the employees and that's all employees so it's health and welfare it's a 401k mm -hmm. it's sure. training okay. it's a myriad of things that benefit the employees that are doing the work okay and then 
the, the G&A is those costs that you would have, even if you didn't have a contract. So it's the back office. And I, I got to pay for an accounting system. I've got to, you know, if I have a location, I still got to have rent to have my, you know, my email offices. system. So my this, there's a, my you know, the back office accounting, mm -hmm. sadly, that all of that's that G and A. And, and then another cost pool could be what's called material handling, uh, subcontractor handling costs. So that that's what uh, is a popular one and, and common when you have what's called a uh, total value. Um, so there's total cost input, and total value. And, and I've seen a myriad when I was auditing incurred costs, I've seen 50 intermediate cost pools. Mm. Uh, that gets very complex with these large companies where they have so many intermediate cost pools Yeah, to get to what's called the final cost pool. But most small companies, you're fine starting out with one overhead, one friend, mm. one G&A. You can expand if your operations change and like, right. oh, we're going service contract act, but, you know, we're getting some of this high end Intel IC type work where you pay a lot of money for these employees because they have to be TSSCI mm -hmm. and we're paying really good benefits. So the benefits we're paying there. So we have two fringe pools and, and that's a very popular um, reason to have an economical reason to have two fringe pools. pools. Okay. Two well, overheads because you're paying for workers at work on site. Although since COVID and remote work, right. that has changed. That landscape mm. has changed. Yeah. Uh, there are government contractors and they have employees that still have to go into the government office, especially in the, you know, SCIF and secure mm. facilities type thing. But if they reduce their costs, you know, hey, I'm no longer going to have an office space. I'm going to do maybe uh, WeWork or Regis or very you know limited shared space or maybe work from home because I'm not working on things that need to be secure. Then there's costs are going to go down, right? And, and your rates are going to be more favorable. So maybe you plow that into hiring, training, retaining. Uh -huh. and, and more fringe benefits, you know, through your 401k contribution. We're seeing that dynamic where it's move away from a Change. big office space, uh -huh. lower that cost and put it more into supporting people, putting into more IT infrastructure, okay, being yes. able to have multiple uh -huh. monitors and, you know, teams and, uh -huh. and video conferencing and, and those type of things. So that that's a trend that we're seeing um, that skyrocketed after COVID. Makes and sense. I don't see that going back. You're right. I mean, it makes total sense. The The landscape has changed, like you said, right? So uh, we don't, may not need the buildings as much, but we definitely need uh, to help them be work from home comfortably. So I get that. Yes. So great lead in now to this thing called wrap rates. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. how does that and what? Okay. First of all, what is a wrap rate? I know it has, we, it has to do with all of your cost and unit cost, et cetera. Um, and then how does that then drive profitability? Profitability. <clears throat> So wrap rate is what can I bill for my, you know, let's say you're just all professional services for every dollar of direct labor, add on my fringe costs, overhead, fringe, g &A, right? Fringe, g &A overhead, add all those costs up. What is that per hour cost? And how much do I have, how much can I put on top of that in what's called a fee? Mm -hmm. Right, because I, I want to make a profit. I'm not. A, I don't want to be a break-even company. Right, and it's understanding the profit each hour of work generates to bill. What am I going to bill the government? That's what that really boils down to. Is how can I come up with the per hour bill rate for this employee that's doing this work? Whether it's just the the founder of the firm who's doing that work is like, okay, what am I going to be able to pay myself? Mm -hmm. What is going to be my salary? Right. What can I afford? What can they afford to pay me as direct labor and divide that by 2080 or to 2024, 2088? Because we have a we have an extra, mm -hmm. right? We're in the lead. You, mm -hmm. you actually have to divide it by the 2088. So right. you take that salary and divide it by 2088. That's your per hour direct labor cost. And then you calculate what's called your rates. So what is my fringe rate, which is a typical rate, is anywhere from you know, 25, I've seen up to as high as 50%, meaning 
50% of my labor costs is fringe costs or 25%. And then overhead, right? So maybe that's 10%. And GNA, maybe that's 15 to 20%. So you add all those up, and that comes up with a dollar, say 80. Uh, for every dollar 80 is my is my cost. And then I want to get 10% fee on that. So that's $18. So I would bill my bill rate would be a dollar eighty plus you know the 18 cents, and that's for every dollar, and then you multiply it by the, the mean, actual hourly rates and mm -hmm. the, you know, <laughs> and that's how you come up with your rates. And you go, okay, this is what I'm going to charge. And it's and it can change based on how much you grow, because mm -hmm. the more people you hire, the more your labor and direct labor base grows, but maybe you don't need to invest as much in the overhead and GNA because you've already built that up. Right. Your rates start to drop and you become more competitive. You know, so that's where it's understanding, well, what happens if I win this contract? So forecasting on on winning a contract is mm -hmm. very important because it can change your rates. So basically you need to grow and build fast. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. benefits you to grow and build fast. Yes, it does. Yes, it uh, does. Okay. So you can have lower rates, be more competitive. Yeah. Okay. So the whole build slow, get rich <laughs> slow. <laughs> it's probably does not, it does not need to. Yeah. Work. It's go big or go home. Right. Go big, it's, go if go you home. just want to hire three or four people, I mean, I don't know that it's worth it. I would just say go stay as a, you know, employee right, somewhere. But mm -hmm. if you really want to grow and succeed, it's, it's get on big contracts, you know, bring on a 20 person contract and then a 40 person contract. And then maybe it's a hundred person contract. You don't know. It all depends. And then in today's world, it's a lot of IT, a lot of innovation. So there's other things now that the government's looking at. So if you, it's, it's really not just about costs anymore. It's what, what kind of innovation can you bring? And, and, you know, it's true. That's true. So that's really good because, you know, in the contracting world, I'm sure you've heard this, um, the, all the energy, all the effort that you're going to put in to go after a $1 million contract, you might as well, you can put the same energy, same time and go after the 10, right? And it right. brings in much more growth. You can grow faster. So why not put all the energy and effort at the 10 versus the one? Yeah. Yeah. And, so. and it's, you know, understanding what that does to your business when yeah. you finally win it, uh, if you win it. And uh, I, I see that you, know, you may be a two or three million a year company and then you win win a big contract. Next thing you know, you're 10 million a year. And where I really see, you know, you start hitting that 10 to 25 million. That's where it starts to become, OK, can I get to that 50 million and then 100 million? So that's where it really gets tough. So, but yeah, you, know, you can manage that 10 to 25 kind of consistently. It's can mm -hmm. you explode it after that? And that's really basically don't make it a lifestyle company. I know it seems, you know, like that that's your money. Why well, I want to take it out. I want to live nice. I want to have the beach home. I want to have right. <laughs> the nice cars. It's like, no, invest in your reinvest, company. Reinvest, yeah. reinvest, reinvest, build it up, surround yourself. Maybe it's due acquisition, a small acquisition. Uh get in get involved in mentor protege and, and not since you you know if you've made it and you're doing well you know getting do mentor protege help smalls and then you can keep winning especially when you graduate uh those yeah. type of aspects and, and if you start winning open contracts there's a high likelihood you'll get purchased um, that's why you're seeing so many uh, when you look at what companies are looking for, the larger companies or the or the private equity firms, they're looking for those firms that can compete in the open market, but they haven't yet exploded. So they're a little bit more affordable. Uh, so if you can win open contracts, be competitive um, and and profitable, uh, that's that's key. <laughs> profitable. Uh, profitable and, right and that's where you know m a down the road is is is, a, is could be a way to go well i think every well i know of a lot of people we that's, that's all we we talk about right is the m a that's like where you want to get to right yeah yeah I, I have a client that's about to sell uh their 
close. They got our approach. They they knew they were going to go out to sell. They won some big recompetes in the open market, and you know they're closing a deal uh, into this month. And you know more power to them. I've had clients sell from anywhere from ten million, fifteen million to two hundred fifty million. So um, how, how how do you position then your company? to, you know, to get the max out of it, right? 5X, 7X, the 10X, whatever, right? To yeah. to be bought. Yeah, that, that could be a whole nother 45 minutes right? for a day. <laughs> we'll bring uh, you back in, on to talk I'll about say in a nutshell, strategy. it's to get the higher multiples, you've got to be in that special space, the Intel, the software, the, the things that drive very high margins. Uh, if you're just butts in the seat, staffing, staff aug, you know, even and with interest rates being high, I mean, those multiples are just going to be low. They're going to be, you know, maybe three to six at best. Uh, maybe, but it's really being in those special spaces that that drive margins and you know that black box type stuff that the government seems to want to spend no matter what. Uh, and they're not in an LPTA, you know, lowest price. Oh gosh, yes, please. Uh, arena right so that's to me if you really want value you got to be in those areas uh and and you can't be living off set asides um you're not worth much if you're an 8a sadly um you know i presented at the 8a conference last year and that's that's the risk uh, you know of just living off the 8as you know maybe another 8a could buy you but it's going to be at a bargain price because they can't afford you or you know they're they should yeah you know, they're not going to uh, be uh, uh, eligible for 8A if they've got enough money to buy you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it really is uh, maybe the Alaska Natives might want to buy you um, if there's something you're doing special because they're, you know, they're billion dollar companies. Uh, but again, they could also just go win that work directly if they're an 8A. So you right. got to be very careful with that. That's, that is great information. Um like you said, the spe being the special space, Intel innovation, black box type work. Yeah. You know, I'm sure everybody's gonna go searching. Like, what's the black box type work, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you're right. We're there, right? We're in an area. There's a place in yes. McLean. There's a place up in Maryland and all around. And there's other places. There's <laughs> there's a lot of places. So uh, innovation, it, innovation for sure. And innovation is huge. Uh, whether it's uh, Cyber security cyber, and cyber right. technology, uh, understanding those things, uh, they're huge. Uh, cloud, cloud migration has big, been big. I mean, just, I, I mean, I think the IRS uh, software is still from the 60s or 70s, right? It's like, okay, at some point, there needs to be some major upgrading of some of the software systems. And, and who's going to win that work and how's it going to be done, right? Yeah, they and are, it's, it's they are actually putting out a big um, right. IDIQ. They're working right now on the IDIQ for their modernization system. So Right. So and maybe you can be a part of that because you specialize right. something that a big doesn't have, but they're big enough to run the whole project, but they need you uh, because you've developed something that you, know, you own the rights to and you, you know, potentially trademarked or patented and things of that nature uniqueness uniqueness yes that's that's going to be definitely the key okay uh awesome uh, that gives a lot of good information for them um and so i would wrap up maybe because we're coming to the end of our hour here so how do you help forecast right how do you help the companies to forecast like i said so i read okay go ahead mm -hmm. No, so uh, like I said, we have the one consulting practice. Um, they have worked with, they, one of the software products, there's an Oracle product uh, as well as another competitor. Uh, and, and that layers on top of say existing software. Cause I can tell you like the Dell techs of the world, you, mm -hmm. they, they don't really do it. Um, so there, a lot of times it's being done in Excel. And so, you know, if you're a small company, most likely it's just going to be some sort of Excel spreadsheet and it's just first putting a budget together, right? There's a budget, which uh, I can only spend so much. And then there's a forecast that says, okay, if I win this contract and you build in, if I add 10 people at X, you know, per hour dollars, 
what does that look like? And then you start modeling that out. And it's going to be some sort of spreadsheet. Uh, if you're a small company, there are some, uh, uh, like Procast, I think, has it. And it's actually, I think, it's called something else now. But uh, it's one of those um, abilities to just take, what do I have? And, and it's just using Excel. For the larger companies, there are very complex mm -hmm. uh, software that's, I'm talking, you know, seven figure type implementation to get oh, it working and getting mm -hmm. in um, they are start scaling that down especially now with ai and power bi and other data analytics and other things uh, but you know if anyone's really interested in there's folks that i i don't do that work we have a whole nother team that does that uh it's called our bpm uh, group um, business process management and and they focus heavily on the large government contractors, but they are starting to scale down because the software is becoming more affordable. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and so that's it. And having those cap, you know, being able to get development dashboarding, key performance indicators and like which contracts are really driving profit, you know, which ones are not. And then what, what does this look like if we win this huge contract for our rates? And it can kind of do that modeling where in mm -hmm. Excel is very manually intensive. So if you're a small con a contractor, it can right. be done in Excel, absolutely, and, okay. and usually is. Okay, and that is definitely recommended. How often should they be doing that? I, I would say at least twice a year if you're small. Okay. You know, start out with a year end. Okay, I'm going to project next year, starting in maybe October or or November, um, maybe maybe as late as December, and say, so, okay, let's let's look at what next year is going to look like, uh, and then. Again, reevaluate it in June, into June, maybe in July, and go, all right, how do we do? Right? Those type of things. And, and you know, if you're small, I think that would be reasonable. There's no reason to look at it every month or every quarter, I think, at that point. But as you grow, mm -hmm. uh, and then it, it also cycles around when your big recompetes are coming up or when you're going after a big contract and go, okay, what does that look like? Right. And maybe it's mm -hmm. an award that's going to come out in July or August. Uh, so that that's something that I think would be when you would want to do things like that. Well, that's great. That is um, wonderful information. I think we've taken our audience from getting started, right? To I mean, some really great foundational like information they need to consider things they should be doing. Um, so as we're wrapping up, are there any other resources or recommendations? Anything that they can do? to help themselves be a little bit more educated on the, what they, you know, like how to read a balance sheet, how to profit and loss state. It's like, you know, is there anything that they could do to be, to educate themselves um, or any yeah, do you, Google, I will say you know, like, if you, there are things out there, there are tutorials, uh, there are uh, courses out there and, and it's really, and surround yourself with, those advisors or people who can help, whether it's an attorney, whether it's an accountant, whether it's a, a banker that that works in the space, uh, it's it's surrounding yourself with people who know other people and can give you resources. And and that's I I find like I don't uh, pretend to know everything, and I absolutely don't. Mm -hmm. But where I I like to help is if I don't know it, I'll get you somebody who does. And if they don't know it. You know, maybe they know somebody. So it's really about networking and having uh, uh, resources to reach out to, not just trying to do it on your own or relying on you know one person to do everything. It's really surrounding yourself with business advisors, especially folks that have done it and and you know 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 how to navigate the landscape. Well, great advice. Thank you so much, Pete, for joining us on our. Uh, podcast today. I really believe that our small businesses, um, they, they, I think they can really learn a lot if they really hone in to all the nuggets that you shared with us today. So I really do appreciate your time, your expertise, your passion. I can tell that you're passionate about it. You love what you do. So thanks again. And I wish you all the best in what you continue to do and how you continue to support your clients as well. Thank you, Randy. And again, I greatly appreciate this opportunity as well. If anyone ever wants to reach out, just you know, ask questions. I'm always available.
and they can read, they'll know how to reach you uh, via our show notes. So they'll have your contact information, LinkedIn. They can definitely reach out to you that way as well. So thank you so much, Pete. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Take care.